Chapter 10 The country seemed to gather itself together to wait the outcome of the battle that lay ahead at New Orleans. James Madison hoped again, hoped against hope, that the commanding general, Andrew Jackson, would be equal to it. Jackson had won a decisive battle against the Creek Indians earlier in the year, but he was reported to have strong personal reasons for hating the British. And he had a reputation for being a fiery fighter, Old Hickory. This man called him because he was so tough, but Madison had counted on generals before who had disapproved of him, disappointed him. He would simply have to wait and see. It was hard to wait, but it was ever harder to know that while he was waiting, New England Federalists were meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, to consider ways of opposing Madison in the year, in the war. Not a day passed without Federalist press accusing Madison of being a tyrant or of being incompatible incompetent, or or of violating the Constitution. The Federalists insisted that there was no way that Americans can win this war. Of course, these Federalist newspapers were were read in England. Of course, such settlements encouraged the British to prolong the fighting. A friend of Madison contended that the eastern states provided the greatest, if not the sole, inducement with the enemy to preserve. But Madison, no matter what was said or how much he was slandered, would do nothing to try to keep those New England would do nothing to try to keep those New England Federalists quiet. But naturally, he was upset. Indeed, according to one observant, Madison looked miserable, shattering and wobgone. His mind is full of New England situations. What would New England do? There was rumors of a secession. Rumors of New England making a separate peace with England. Rumors of impeaching the president. The bond of union is broken. The delegates announced as they sought unconstitutional methods of changing the constitution. In the end, however, the Hartford meeting decided to postpone any action until June. By that time, one member pointed out that the battle for New England would be over and lost. Then what could Madison be do but resign? Meanwhile, in a hotel, New Orleans General Andrew Jackson lay in bed, sick with dysentery. Terry, he had predicted that the enemy would avoid the swamps and the bayous and the lakes that surrounded New Orleans and land instead at Mobile, Alabama, then march north and west to the city. He was wrong. The British commander, Major General Sir Edward Pinkham, lended a fleet of 50 ships and 10,000 troops at the entrance to a bay immediately east of New Orleans. General Packenham not only carried a paper which would make him governor of Louisiana as soon as he conquered it, 
but he had the promise of becoming an earl. Perhaps he was over anxious and he did not take time to explore the nat nature of the terrain. Swamps, lakes, cedars, forests. He had to drag his 10,000 men through all this before they reached a clearing near the Mississippi River. On the morning of December 23rd, 1814, they were nine miles from the city when General Jackson heard where they were. He leaped out of his six bed, sick bed by the eternal, he cried, while fighting them tonight. We'll fight them tonight. Jackson had only half a, as many troops as the British, but he assembled them quickly and marched down the river, reaching the British camp shortly after dark. Night battles, however, are seldom successful. After several hours of shooting blindly, Americans firing as often as not into other Americans, British into British, Jackson called off the attack. There were several other attempts before the big battle of New Orleans took place on January 8, 1815. Jackson had packed his position carefully behind an abandoned kennel. Jackson's men had built a rampart high enough to reach a man's shoulders, thick enough to stop a cannonball. On the right was the Mississippi River. On the left was a swamp, so the British would be forced to march over flat circan fields toward that rampart where the Americans waited after trying various maneuvers. The British, equipped with scaling ladders, decided to make simulation attacks on all sides of the rampart at the same time. Right from the beginning, however, they were in trouble. Since they had to keep marching forward, they had no time to reload their guns. The Americans, on the other hand, had fired all the time not all together in systematic vo volleys as the British had been taught to do. When an American ran out of ammunition, he just ducked down behind the rampart, reloaded, then fired again. Every man for himself in the Constitution wall of fire. Himself in a continuous wall of fire. The battle eventually lasted two hours, but most of the fighting was over in 30 minutes. 2,000 British soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured. Pakenham, shot in the neck, dropped from the, his horse and died almost immediately. As for the Americans, only 13 men were lost, 7 killed, 6 wounded, and now they had to get the news to Washington. Unif Unfortunately, they, the weather was against them. There had been torrential rains. All the rivers were flooded. And it took almost a month for the news of, to arrive. Meanwhile, in New England... Federalists claimed that Madison was covering up a defeat at New Orleans. Why hadn't Louisiana be properly defended? They asked. Go ask the wind, they said. Don't expect an answer from Madison. On February 4th, the news came, and Americans went wild. It was not only a victory it was a long slide victory and the british navy 
It was limping away from American waters. Every day the news became sweeter. Did you hear? Some of the very men who had set Washington on fire had been in the battle. Set off fireworks, ring the bells, light bonfires. Americans could not bear to stop celebrating. And why should they? This was the best news since Cornwallis had been defeated. And at last, they had a war hero whom they could take to heart. Ten days later, on February 14th, when the people in Washington were just beginning to wind down from all their celebration, a coach pulled by four horses careened down Pennsylvania Avenue and stopped short at the Madison's oct octagon house. A messenger was with a paper was admitted and dashed up the stairs to Madison's study, where he was meeting with his cabinet. A few moments later, Madison came to the head of the staircase. Dolly, he shouted, It's peace! Peace! Dolly cried. She was so excited, she couldn't stop repeating the words from room to room to the several servants' quarters all over the house. She ran, peace, peace, she sang. The servants rang the dinner bell, and soon bells were ringing all over Washington. Apparently, the messenger had already spread the news as his carriage sped through the city and everyone had simply burst into the streets, too happy to contain themselves inside. Dolly Madison threw open the doors to the octagon house, ordered bottles to be opened, wine to be poured, and told the ser servants to light candles in every window. This was tr the Treaty of Gant signed by British and the United States Commissioners of, on December 24th, 15 days before the Battle of New Orleans had been fought. Had they known in time the battles, the battle would not have been necessary, but perhaps in one sense it was lucky that they didn't know the victory at New Orleans had given Americans a new conf confidence in themselves as an independent nation, and the world had taken notice. Madison signed the peace treaty the same night at, as he received it, and the Senate ratified it the next day. Now, suddenly, James Madison was a hero. Even his former critics were heaping praise on him, and the Massachusetts legislature sent him an apology for the, the behavior of some of the citizens. Madison was little affected by all the super, superlatives flung in his direction. All he could think of was the Union had survived, and he was wary. He had been in Washington 11 solid months, and he could hardly wait to get to Montpelier for a vacation. He and Dolly left Washington at the end of March early than usual, and probably in time to catch the red buds and bloom. Of course, they didn't vacation alone. They never did, but there was one person whom Dolly longed to see at Montpelier above all others. Payne. Where was he? Peace had been signed. What possible excuse did he have to stay any longer?
Then some of that peace commissioners returned home. They brought with them trunks of Payne's clothes and artwork he had been collecting. As for Payne himself, all they could report was that he'd missed the boat in France and again in England. Eventually, he did appear that summer, tall and handsome as ever, in the more than two years that he had been away, however, he had picked up French manners and French taste, and a habit of spending far more money than he had. His debts trailed him and would always trail him wherever he went. James paid them off as he could, but because they worried Dolly, he often kept secret that the amount he was paying. As time went on, this secret ran to $40,000, and even so, Payne was twice but in debtor's prison for short periods. But right now, James and Dolly still hopes that Payne would settle down and make a life for himself. But he did not want to go to Princeton, he said. He was too old and too experienced for that. He didn't know what he wanted. Perhaps he could just travel. But James would have none of that. No, no. Payne could serve as his secretary, and of course this pleased Dolly. Now she could stop worrying, precious Payne would be with them, and when they returned to Washington, she would show Payne that Washington could be just as charming as Paris. They returned in October, not to the Octagon House, but to seven buildings. The former House of Vice Presidents, Gary, who had died in office, the house was large with 31 windows, and one had only to look out of the windows to see that the President's old mansion now, under reconstruction, two blocks away the outside of the building was being repainted white. And perhaps because this was such a welcome relief to the charmed frame, the British had left. People began calling it the White House. It would not be finished in time for Dolly to move in, but she was happy settling down in her new quarters close to the street and to passers-by. Whenever disbanded soldiers marched past, they always stopped in front of the house, raised their hats, and gave three cheers to Mrs. Madison. Huzzah! 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 They would cry, and Dolly would come to the door, wave and wish them well. Children would gather before the front window, where they would watch Dolly feed and play with her pet parrot. When she had time, she would make a little show for the children. There was a year and a half left to Madison's term of office, and Dolly was determined to make the most of it. Because she had so many parties and always illuminated those 31 windows, the house became known as the House with a Thousand Candles. Perhaps her largest and most elaborate party was her New York day, open house, and reception.
for her 1816 New Year's reception, Dolly wore a new yellow satin dress embroidered with butterflies and a turban made of feathers. So many people crowded into the party that it was said that it took Quest Quest 10 minutes guests 10 minutes to squeeze their way across the dining room. Then there was the February reception for the justice of the Supreme Court, the peace commissioners, and the diplomatic corps. For this dolly wore a rose-colored gown with what was described as a mile-long train of white velvet lined with lavender, satin and edged with lace, her turban with white velvet embroidered in gold and topped with ostrich feathers. On Wednesday evening, she held her weekly receptions, and so it went, one social affair after another. Everyone had hoped that General Jackson, the hero of New Orleans, would be present for the winter's activities, and although he and his wife did attend one ball in their honor, Jackson became ill and could not participate in other festival festivities. But in any case, wherever Dolly went, she stole the show. At one party, people stood on benches to see Mrs. Madison in a dramatic black velvet dress, trimmed in gold and wearing a terra set with cypress which James had given her. In March the following year, 1817, when it came for a newly elected president, James Monroe, to take off office, the Madison moved out of seven buildings into Dolly's sister's Anna's house, to give Monroe ample room for his reception. They attended his inaugural ball, but only briefly, for this was Monroe's night, and they didn't want to distract it, for this was attention from him. Still, because there was so many farewell parties for Madison, they could not have wanted to pay, pay, pay tribute to James Madison. Every, every John Randolph, even John Randolph, he admitted that Madison was a great man. As for Madison himself, he was just glad to announce that the American people had reached in safety and succeed success their for 14th year as an independent nation he had done this job and it was with a light heart that he and dolly boarded that new fangled invention the steamboat to go down the potomac river toward home he was 66 years old and a friend said he talked and joked with everyone on board. He was like a schoolboy setting out on a long vacation.